Thank you for sharing your history and your culture with us, Tina. It's very moving. Uh, we, here, residents of the Cape and Islands, we consider Nantucket Sound to be the national bank of the Cape and Islands. Therefore, we feel that it should be secured and protected by the citizens for the citizens. The Cape and Islands have been depending on Nantucket Sound and all the people who live on the Cape and Islands for thousands and thousands of years. Summer after summer, year after year, generation after generation, my clock work, our economy depends on it. Our livelihood depends on it. So, the people of the Cape and Islands, we stand strong with our brothers and sisters of the Wampanoag Nation. With that, I'd like to, I'd like to welcome up my childhood friend, Neil Young. I think Neil Young. Neil Good, we, uh, we grew up on Signal Shores uh, 40 years ago. And the uh, folklore down there at Seaco Shores was uh, Washburn's Island. Well, Washburn's Island, that was, a, that was an Indian burial ground. Every kid on Seaco Shores knew that. I mean, you could just swim across the river and be in a whole new world, full of Indians and uh, pirates. And it was just a fantastic, beautiful place. And you know, you know what it overlooked? It overlooked Nantucket. Same with South Cape Beach. The same with Chappaquiddick. The same with the beautiful cliffs of Aquinnah. When when I'm there, I am in touch with the Great Spirit. And with that, I'd like to welcome up Neil Good. That's better. Okay, well, again, thank you for coming. I know this is an extremely divisive issue. I guess that goes without saying. And so uh, I'm just going to guess that maybe you've got a 50 50 split here people on one side, people on the other. Uh, well, it's quite obvious what side I'm on, or if it isn't, let me say. I'm opposed to Kate Wynn for many reasons. But when this first began eight years ago, I felt very strongly that it would eventually become an issue involving historic preservation because I am someone who's concerned with history. I guess you could say I'm an avid amateur historian. Or maybe just a researcher. I don't like being identified as a historian. I think it sounds, sounds a little too, let's say, snotty. <laughs> but I want to thank Professor Gwadeng Barnes also for sponsoring this event. Dave and I were doing this on a shoestring. We were scared that we were going to have to come, come up with $630 to rent for the room time. But Professor Barnes said, I'll sponsor this. It didn't cost you anything. So I just met her for the first time tonight. I want to thank you again. I also want to thank Barbara Durkin. She's in the audience. She's a private citizen like, like Dave and I. And I can't think of anybody who's worked as hard as she has getting the word out via the internet, via public comments, submitted to all these federal agencies, state agencies too. And so I want to thank Barb for being here. I can't keep up with it. I also have to thank Dave for sticking his neck out and help, helping me get this together. I couldn't have done it without him. Because I think, it, you know, some people are courageous enough to do something like this entirely on their own. I feel a little off being here. I wouldn't have done it by myself. So thanks, Dave, for standing here. Standing here. Then, there's somebody that I thank who's not here. And she's an incredibly important person in this debate at where it stands today. And that would be Rona Simon, the director of the Massachusetts Historical Commission. And I imagine most of you know who Rona is. How about raising your hand if you don't know the Rona Simons? Don't know the Rona Simons. Okay, well, I just think I figured you said she's the director of the Massachusetts Historical Commission. And on November 5th, she issued a very important letter, two-page letter followed by a 21-page opinion. 
For she courageously took a stand and said, Should he agree with the Wampanoags of Mashpee and Gagetaquina, when they demanded that the National Park Service recognize Nantucket Sound as eligible for listing on the Register of Historic Places? The Minerals Management Service heard from me on that same subject about a year ago, October of 2008. And why they heard from me was because when this process began, I found out long ago that the Section 106 process, as it's called, involves historic preservation. And the Minerals Management Service and early other Army Corps of Engineers, by law, is required to review the impacts that a permitted project would have on historic sites in the immediate area. Well, the Army Corps of Engineers never got around to the Section 106 process. The project was handed over to the Minerals Management Service. Well, the Minerals Management Service essentially waited to the very last minute to get this process going. But when I was following along with what was happening and what was not happening, I found out that private citizens can be added to the list of consulting parties in that process. I think I'm the only person who made the effort to get on the list. I am on the list. But believe me, they didn't want to hear from me. But I insisted, very you know, specifically, that I be added to the list. I want to thank Melanie Strike, who at that time was the Minerals Management Services Historic Preservation Officer. She was kind enough to add me to the list. So I got the notices, I got the meetings, and I feel very strongly that Nantucket Sound belongs in the Register of Historic Places. Well, this letter was sent out on November 5th, and she took an incredibly courageous stand, because we've seen all these other public officials in Massachusetts come out in support of Cape Wind. So this is a big deal. This woman took a stand and said, no, I disagree with you. And I believe that Nantucket Sound is eligible for the list of registered historic places. November, November 5th is my birthday. I don't think I could have asked for a better birthday. <laughs> but there are so many other things that I'd like to cover, but I don't have time. I planned yesterday on coming up with a very carefully worded statement. The day I got in touch with me, he said, Neil, we have something important to do. I said, well, what is it? He goes, well, don't ask for me. You've got to go get this. We ended up going on a trip down to Nantucket Sound. First, we walked along the beach down by the knot, and we took a, gl a glimpse of Washburn Island, which Dave mentioned when he was up here in the video. You probably don't know what Washburn Island is. You don't know where it is, but it's on the shoreline of Walkway Bay, which is immediately adjacent to South Cape Beach. Well, to make a long story short, we went to South Cape Beach too. So my plan is to write something for me when I'm smoke. And I'm glad they took me down there. Because as we're walking along South Cape Beach with these beautiful salt marshes on our left and the ocean on our right, we're walking straight ahead and looking at the area where Cape Wind would be built. And I said then and there that this alone is reason to stop Cape Wind. The public that would like to go to South Cape Beach and does go to South Cape Beach shouldn't be subjected to a view of an industrial power plant off in the near distance. So thanks, Dave. Thank you for taking me down. Because it reinforced my position that this project is in the wrong location. But on top of that, I don't believe in wind power. I'm sorry. I was told not to avoid to avoid this subject, but I'm afraid I have to. This is a chance for me to speak about this. We're told again and again and again by the proponents of this project that we have to follow the European lead when developing offshore renewable power projects, wind power, of course. Well, let's take a quick look at what the Germans have done. The Germans decided over the course of 10 years that no offshore wind power plants would be closer than 13 miles to the shoreline. You don't hear about that very often. Why is it that they've decided to place them that far off the coastline to protect the tourist economy on the north coast of Germany? So yeah, let's follow the European lead. I figure that I now have to introduce Dr. King. Dr. King, I think, is the right man at the right time to talk about the right issue. There's no question about that. I found that about Dr. King through the miracle of the internet. Around a year ago, I was Googling, <laughs> Googling, 
to find out more about the Section 106 process. Dr. King's, kept, Dr. King's name kept turning up again and again and again. I decided that this man obviously is an authority, and I attempted to contact him. Got him on the telephone, asked him if he had heard about the Cape Wind debate. He said, yeah, he had. And I asked him if he would be interested in maybe attending some of the Section 106 meetings. Well, it didn't happen out of it happened as I hoped, but he's here tonight, and I'm going to stop there. Because it's without a doubt an ideal time for him to speak about this, because the man wrote the guidelines that the National Park Service is now going to have to use to determine whether or not Nantucket Sound does qualify as a traditional cultural property. In my mind, there's no doubt that it does. Thank you, Dr. Kenny. Well, thank you, Neil. Giving me the uh, excuse to finally see Cape Cod and actually I did on Cape Cod as well. And let me also say at the outset that I have no position on Cape Wind. Um, I do have a strong belief, and long have that strong belief, that people are what the National Historic Preservation Act is about, and that what the act is actually designed to do is protect the interests of American citizens, notably including Native Americans, from the um, from being run roughshod over by government actions. I've worked in and around historic preservation, particularly what we call the Section 106 process, for something over 40 years. I've worked in government, I've worked outside government, I've worked for tribes. Um, I won't go into my personal history, but about 20 years, 25 years ago, I was working for the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, which I'll a little more to say about in a moment, um, and found myself in a position where it was necessary to write some guidance for the federal government about how to deal with what we have come to call traditional cultural properties. Uh, I will take the blame for inventing the term traditional cultural properties. That was not um, a particularly difficult term to invent. But I'd like to go back. There have been an awful lot of uh, strange statements about traditional cultural properties, about the law, about the Section 106 process, noise about in the newspapers and elsewhere in the media with regard to Cape Wind. And I'd like to step back and try to clarify some, some basic points. First off, we're talking about a piece of the National Historic Preservation Act. In this venue, it would be very nice to say that the National Historic Preservation Act was a product of the Kennedy administration, but it was not. It was a product of the Lyndon Johnson administration. It was part of Lyndon Johnson's Great Society program, which included a major emphasis on trying to protect the environment, not by necessarily declaring things to be sacrosanct, but by setting up procedures under which people would have to talk to each other before they destroy aspects of the environment that were precious to people. The National Historic Preservation Act was one of the first pieces of the environmental legislation of the Johnson administration to be enacted. It was enacted in 1966. It's been amended a number of times since then, notably in 1992, when tribal participation was uh, specified in much greater detail than it had been before. What the Act set out to do was it, it directed the National Park Service to maintain something called the National Register of Historic Places. It also set up an advisory council on historic preservation that would advise the President and Congress on historic preservation matters and oversee what came to be called the Section 106 process. It set up grants to states to, set, to establish state historic preservation offices. In this state, it's the Massachusetts 
historical commissions. And it directed federal agencies to take into account the effects of their actions on historic properties. The act has evolved over the years. As of today, we still have the National Register, maintained by the National Park Service. We still have an advisory council in Washington, D.C. We have state and tribal historic preservation officers now, and we have a good deal of direction in the law to federal agencies to consult with tribes and with interested parties of all kinds about the impacts of their actions on places of historic significance. Notably, the act still contains the Section 106 process, and regulations were issued long ago by the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation about how to carry out the Section 106 process. Section 106 says, in essence, that federal agencies have to consider, have to take into account the effects of their actions on places included in or eligible for the National Register. Now, I emphasize that we're eligible for part. That was an amendment to the act that came in in the mid-1970s. Prior to that time, before a property could be considered, or before an agency had to even think about its impact on historic property, that property had to be literally listed in the National Register of Historic Places. My first job in historic preservation was working for a tribe in California, the Cahuilla tribe, trying to challenge a Corps of Engineers dam that would be thrown up across a place called Dockwish Canyon, which is the place where, in the belief of the Cahuilla people, their ancestors came out of a lower world at the beginning of time. We had to literally sneak onto the project site and compile the documentation to nominate that place to the National Register before it could be considered. We were successful in doing so, but it was a real pain, and it cost the tribe a lot of unnecessary time and money. Uh, it also hung up the planning process, because inevitably what happened when things had to be nominated to the National Register is they didn't get listed until rather late in the planning process. Federal agencies tried to keep people from listing things to stay out of trouble. And project opponents would go in and seek to list things. It was a very messy situation. President Nixon fixed it with an executive order that told all agencies to treat anything that was eligible for the National Register as though it were already on. And that language eventually got wrapped into the law itself. The regulations of the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation on how federal agencies are to carry out Section 106 review emphasize consultation. Consultation with tribes, consultation with local governments, consultation with anybody who is interested and concerned about impacts on historic properties to try to resolve conflicts. But the regulations also provide that the federal agency, in this case Minerals Management Service, makes the final decision as to whether a project will go forward or not. Now this is different from the way local historic preservation law works. And I think that one reason we've had confusion and disputes in the last few weeks about the so-called designation of Nantucket Sound as a traditional cultural property is that people get confused between local historic preservation laws, the kind of laws that the city of Boston has, and the federal historic preservation laws, which are really quite different. In local historic preservation ordinances, you have a very formal process to designate places as landmarks, as historic landmarks. In the federal system, when you get right down to it, designation is irrelevant to the protection or to the management or to decision making about historic properties. There is very strict protection under local laws. Typically, once something is designated a historic property, a landmark, it is sacrosanct. It cannot be touched. It has to be protected. In the federal system, 
agencies are simply responsible for taking their effects into account in a particular structured manner. Local preservation laws typically have review commissions with a great deal of power to regulate what's done to historic properties. The federal system has an advisory council that is, as its name implies, advisory. It advises the president, it advises the Congress, and it advises federal agencies. Local systems typically say that you can't change a designated landmark without the permission of the Review Commission. The federal system leaves that to the discretion of the agency, provided that the agency goes through a program of consultation, analysis, and alternatives consideration. Local designations apply to private citizens and private actions. If I own a house in a designated historic district, there are a lot of things that I can't do to it because the Historic District Commission will get on my case if I paint my house pink or something of the kind. The federal system applies only to federal actions and federal licenses, federal permits, federal grants. So it's important to keep those distinctions understood because the, di the differences are important. The basic idea behind the Section 106 process, the consideration of impacts on historic properties by federal agencies in consultation with interested parties, is the government shouldn't help destroy things that are important to people for historic and cultural reasons. Unless it's consulted with them, try to find ways to address their concerns consider alternatives that will address those concerns, and then reach a reasoned decision based on that consultation. Often we lose that basic idea in the procedural details that have grown up around the Section 106 process, and particularly around the National Register of Historic Places. Now what is this National Register? It's nothing more than a list. It's a list maintained by the National Park Service. It includes what are called districts, sites, building structures, and objects. They're nominated to the list through the State Historic Preservation Officers. It's a tedious process. It's an onerous process. I don't recommend it. And I don't recommend it because eligible properties get the same consideration under Section 106 as do properties that have actually been listed in the National Register. And eligible simply means that you meet the criteria that have been published by the National Park Service for listing in the register. Actual designation is irrelevant to Section 106 review. Now a property is eligible for the National Register if first it is a property. It has to be a place. It has to be a piece of real estate or occasionally something like a ship or an airplane. But it basically has to be a place. It has to have integrity, which means it can't be so messed up that it's lost whatever made it significant in the first place. And then it needs to be associated with significant events in the past, as criterion A, patterns of events, or associated with significant people in the past, criterion B, or representative of a type or a style or a school of architecture or something of the kind, that's criterion C, or it has to be a distinguishable entity, that's also part of criterion C, or it has to have the potential to produce important data, that's criterion D. Now we can get all wrapped up in tedious, silly, academic arguments about which criterion is met and not met, and we do that all the time. It's what, what uh, practitioners in this game spend their time doing and make inordinate amounts of money doing. Uh, I should say the property also has to not fall into one of several excluded classes, and that all gets so, so complicated and esoteric that I won't even begin to go into it. So that's what the National Register is, and that's what National Register eligibility is. And what's a traditional cultural property? Traditional cultural property is simply what its name implies. It's a place, a property that figures in somebody's traditional culture. 
and it's eligible for the National Register if it meets one or more of the National Register criteria. Most traditional cultural properties are found eligible under Criterion A for their association with traditional beliefs, traditional culture, traditional history. The term was coined when Patricia Parker of the National Park Service and I wrote a thing called National Register Bulletin 38 back in the, 19, the late 1980s. It was published in 1990. It is most often applied to places important to Native American groups, Indian tribes and Native Hawaiians who have been the most active users, if you will, of the traditional cultural property concept, though theoretically it applies to anybody's places. I want to make one thing very clear if I can. Nobody is authorized by any law to designate a place a traditional cultural property. The Secretary of the Interior does not have the right to say, yes, Wampanoa, your place is a traditional cultural property, or no, it is not. It's not a matter of formally designating something. A place is a traditional cultural property if it figures in a group's traditional culture. It's got to be a piece of property. Somebody has to ascribe cultural value to it, and that value has to somehow be linked to tradition. If it meets those standards, it's a traditional cultural property. Let me use an analogy. What is this thing you're looking at here? Is it an airplane? Is it a pine tree? Is it a Georgian revival house? Well, it's a boat, right? How do you know it's a boat? Well, it's in the water. That's a good start. It's in the water. It's got a pointy thing on the front. It's sort of blood on the back. It floats. It's got something sticking out the top with a, with a piece of canvas on it. You recognize that as a boat. Do you need the Secretary of the Interior to tell you it's a boat? Of course not. And in the same way, we don't need the Secretary of the Interior to tell us that something's a traditional cultural property. The Secretary of the Interior is authorized to designate something as eligible for the National Register, or not eligible for the National Register. That's in the National Historic Preservation Act. But it's important to recognize that a place doesn't become eligible when the Secretary designates it. A place is eligible if it meets the Secretary's criteria for eligibility, the ones we just looked at. And it doesn't matter whether anybody has ever designated anything. That property can be sitting out there in the field, or in this case, sitting out there in the ocean, without anybody designating it. And it is still eligible if it meets the criteria. Again, an analogy. The Old North Church, did it become historic? Did it become historically significant when the Secretary of the Interior made it into a National Historic Landmark? No, of course not. It was historic before there was a Secretary of the Interior. It was historic before there were any laws to make it, to make it, put it on, on a register. We recognize it as significant, and that's why it gets listed the National Register. Now here's an example of a traditional cultural property. And it exemplifies a lot of the issues that we often have with traditional cultural properties. For one thing, it's natural. It's a lake. It's big. It's a great big body of water surrounded by land. Mostly surrounded by land. It is regarded as very, very significant, culturally and spiritually significant, to a particular cultural group. It is not in this country. Can you guess where it is and who it's significant to? Anybody? No, oh, it's a quiet group. Um, it's the Sea of Galilee. Photograph from the Golan Heights. It's significant. It's a traditional cultural property to that little group of folks called Christians who believe that their spiritual leader walked around on it. 
weird beliefs, strange beliefs, but they believe it. And it makes it a very important place, and it makes it difficult for the nations of Israel and Jordan to manage. It really puts a crimp in their, their management. But the fact remains that it is a significant cultural place. Okay, why did we have to write a bulletin about this? Why did we have to write National Register Bulletin 38? There were two cases back in the mid-1980s that led to Bulletin 38. I, at the time, was working for the National Park for the Advisory Council on Historic Preservation, overseeing Section 106 review. I was responsible for overseeing how Section 106 review was done by all the agencies of the federal government nationwide. Um, Patricia Parker, my co-author, was then, as she is now, working for the National Park Service. There were two cases that came up that showed that we had a problem with the way the National Register criteria were being interpreted. One involved the San Francisco Peaks, which we see here in Arizona. The San Francisco Peaks are one of the four corners of the Navajo world. The Navajo regard the San Francisco Peaks as a very, very sacred place. They're also sacred to the Hopi tribe, because to the Hopi, it's where the Kachina live. And the Kachina bring rain, the Kachina basically regulate the universe. They're very important spirit beings. The Department of Agriculture Forest Service proposed to issue a license for a ski resort on the upper slopes of the San Francisco Peaks. You may have heard of the San Francisco Peaks in recent years, but in another case, this is an earlier case. This is back in the 80s. The Forest Service said, okay, we have to comply with Section 106, so we have to find out if we're going to have any impacts on historic properties. They sent archaeologists up on the peaks, and they didn't find anything. So they said, well, there's nothing there, so we have nothing to deal with. The Navajo said, of course there's nothing there. The peaks are so sacred, we never go up there. <laughs> the Hopi said, of course there's nothing you can see there. The Kachina don't leave things that archaeologists can find. But the Forest Service at that time, under the regulations that were then in force, was able to go ahead and say it's not eligible for the National Register because we and the State Historic Preservation Officer agree that since our archaeologists can't find anything, it's not eligible. It was determined not eligible, even though it went to court, and the project proceeded. That didn't seem right. That didn't seem right because the interests of the people, the interests of the tribe, were simply being ignored, uh, utterly disrespected. Now, it may be that the ski resort was the thing to do. Maybe it was a perfectly viable project. But we, my co-author and I felt, and we were able to sell this to the Advisory Council of the National Park Service in the Reagan administration, we felt that the people's views shouldn't be so disregarded. About the same time, there was poll tap in Detroit, Michigan. The city of Detroit had money from the Department of Housing and Urban Development to help put in a new Cadillac plant. And to do that, they had to take out a whole Polish-American neighborhood that had been there for 100 years or so. The people of poll tap didn't want to go. And they argued that their neighborhood was eligible for the National Register. HUD and the city of Detroit said, no, it doesn't have any great architecture, so it's not eligible. And they were able to get away with that. And the people of Pole Town, though they chained themselves to the doors of their cathedral, were dragged out and their neighborhood was, was raised. Again, maybe the Cadillac plant was the thing to do, but we didn't feel like their interests should be so totally disrespected in the process. So we ended up writing this bullet that advises agencies about how this kind of property, which had been found eligible for the National Register repeatedly in the past, ought to be dealt with, how it ought to be, how such places ought to be evaluated. Basically, the guidelines say they're basically aimed at federal agencies, and they go through page after page after page of bureaucratic nonsense, the kind of stuff that, that government agencies write, people like me who work for government agencies, Right. But what it all comes down to, the bottom line is you ask the people. If people think that a place is significant, you treat it as significant. And you consult with them about it. 
Well, as soon as Bulletin 38 was issued, it was rejected by three major agencies, the Bureau of Land Management, the Forest Service, and of all people, the Bureau of Indian Affairs, sent out guidance to their field offices saying, this is a National Park Service publication, you don't have to deal with it. That really irritated a lot of tribes and a lot of intertribal organizations. And the result was the tribes went to the Hill and talked to members of Congress and when the National Historic Preservation Act was amended in 1992, there was a new section, Section 101 D6, that made it clear, said flatly, that tribal places, didn't call them TCPs, traditional cultural properties, called them uh, places of cultural and religious significance, but same thing, said that they could be eligible for the register and that agencies must consult with tribes about their impacts on such places. This was nothing more than a reminder. It was nothing more than a slap on the wrist to these three recalcitrant agencies because these kind of properties had been determined eligible for the register as long as there had been a register, but agencies were getting drifted away from it. Now, I can't resist chilling my book a little bit. I have a book that came out in 2003 that goes into great detail about traditional cultural properties, and I'd certainly recommend it to you from all of your press. Uh, but it is entirely unofficial. It's what I think, it's not what the National Park Service thinks. I want to show a few examples of properties that have been determined eligible as traditional cultural properties around the country. This is part of the Hell Cow Historic District in Northern California. It's a place where local tribes, the Tolwa, the Hupa, the Yurok, and the Karuk, uh, believe there's a hole in the sky and wisdom comes down to their elders, to their medicine people uh, when they go up there and, and pray. And uh, in connection with a proposed forest service road through the area, the Hell Cow Historic District was determined eligible for the National Register back in the mid-1970s. Mid this one is Cave Rock in Nevada, very important place to the Washoe tribe. A natural rock, it's got a hole in it, not only a cave over here on the one, one side, but a highway tunnel on the other side, uh, but still a very significant place in the beliefs and traditions of the Washoe people. The Forest Service in this case has recently, uh, about two years ago now, come to the conclusion that it should forbid rock climbers from climbing on cave rock, in part because of the offense that it gave to, to the tribe. This case went to court because rock climbers immediately challenged it under the First Amendment to the Constitution. It said the federal government here is establishing Washoe religion, as, and that's against the establishment clause of the First Amendment to the Constitution. The court disagreed. And the case went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and the Ninth Circuit upheld the decision. Um, this is uh, my first Section 106 case, Rockwish Canyon in California, where the beliefs that the Cahuilla people, their ancestors, came out of the lower world at the beginning of time. This was determined eligible with the first <coughs> national register in connection with the proposed Corps of Engineers Dam, which was later abandoned. This is a place called Mount Chanacha in Chuk, uh, an island group in Micronesia that is a state for purposes of the National Historic Preservation Act. So they participate under the National Historic Preservation Program. In the beliefs of the Chukese people, their culture founder, Solkachap, came in the form of a cosmic frigate bird to the top of that mountain, the Achao, and established his meeting house from which he spread culture throughout the lagoon. It's on the National Register as a traditional cultural property. These sandbars were in the Rio Grande in New Mexico, uh, just outside of Albuquerque on the edge of Sandia Pueblo. Sandia Pueblo people immersed themselves in the river water on these sandbars in connection as part of religious rituals. This became an issue a few years ago when there was a proposal to put in a housing project that would pump 
sewage through a sewage treatment plant into the river upstream of the sandbars. And the tribe said, wait a minute, you're going to be pumping sewage into the area where we immerse ourselves. That's a real serious problem. They alleged th that the sandbars were eligible for the National Register. The project proponents and the federal agency involved, the U.S. Environmental Protection Agency, said nonsense. They're not, they're not traditional cultural properties because, you know, A, we don't believe you really carry out rituals there, and B, uh, you, the sandbars probably didn't even exist until a dam was built upstream to change the flow regime in the river. Well, the tribe, the matter went to the keeper of the National Register, just as Nantucket Sound is the keeper now. And the tribe brought in their own ethnographer to talk about how they did indeed um, carry out rituals on the sandbar, and they brought in aerial photographs showing the sandbar in place before the dam was built. At that point, the keeper determined the property's eligible. Anderson Air Force, on Air Force Base on the island of Guam, uh, has basically keeps this whole area of rainforest pristine, protects it as a National Register eligible traditional cultural property because the local Chamorro people uh, gather traditional medicine there that's important in their spiritual life and in their, uh, their native medicine. Here are a couple of rather big traditional cultural properties. That's Mount Shasta over there, the pointy one. Mount Shasta in its entirety is a traditional cultural property to a lot of Northern California groups. There's been a silly argument about what its boundaries are, but the tribes believe that the whole mountain is sacred and it has been determined eligible for the National Register. The area in the foreground is a huge volcanic caldera called the Medicine Lake Highlands. And it's been in and out of court for quite a while, but it has been determined eligible uh, for the National Register as a traditional cultural property because of its significance, particularly to the Pitt River tribe. And Pitt River people have been successful in stopping a geothermal development project that would affect this landscape. This is called the Trail of Dreams. I can't possibly get a picture of the whole thing because it's too big. It's a system of trails and prayer circles and a whole variety of things that stretches all the way from Mexico to Los Angeles. And in the belief of the Quichon tribe on the lower Colorado River, they travel along, they and their ancestors travel along this trail, not only physically, but in their dreams to get to other worlds and gain knowledge. This this area was determined eligible for the National Register by the Bureau of Land Management, and uh, a proposed gold mine that was going to go in in the middle of this landscape uh, was ultimately halted after Section 106 review uh, during the Clinton administration. It's a long political story from there, but it ultimately has been halted uh, for a this is a place called Bushkagagamon Sebi. I love the fact that I can pronounce that. It's an Ojibwe word, meaning little, little river of medicines. And it's a landscape uh, just east of the Mole Lake Sokagan Ojibwe Reservation. It's made up of a number of parts. Rice Lake, where they grow wild rice. A number of springs, where they collect very, very pure water for use in ceremonies. The rapids, where they fish. Spirit Hill, associated, as you can imagine, with spirits. A variety of hunting areas and so on. This whole area, in connection with the proposed mine uh, that was going to go in in the middle of it, was determined eligible for the National Register as the Mushkagagan on City Historic District. Klamath River in California. Uh, I worked a few years ago for the Klamath River Intertribal Fish and Water Commission to do a study showing that the entire river the dams upstream down the Pacific Coast was eligible for the National Register, and that the fish, the salmon that migrate up the river, are an important contributing element to its historic significance. That was accepted by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission uh, in the 106 case. 
Now, there are other laws that we need to be aware of that apply to this kind of situation. One is the Religious Freedom Restoration Act, which says that the federal government will do nothing to uh, significantly burden anyone's practice of religion unless there is a compelling government reason to do so. The American Indian Religious Freedom Act says that the federal government will respect the inherent right of American Indian tribes to the free exercise of their traditional religions. The National Environmental Policy Act says that we've got to take into account the effects of our actions on all aspects of the environment. And there are several executive orders, uh, all actually from the Clinton administration, interestingly enough. Um, one having to do requiring consultation with tribes on policy making, another protecting Indian sacred sites on federal land, and another dealing with environmental justice, not running roughshod over the interests of low income and minority groups. Now, none of these require or turn on national register eligibility. One more case that I want to talk about, because it's a recent case that I think has some implications uh, for Nantucket Sound. Medicine Bluff at Fort Sill, Oklahoma. This is a painting of a historical sea in Medicine Bluff. This is what it looks like today. It's on the on Fort Sill, an army base, and this is a schematic with also the title of the court case uh, that's well, been, been settled uh, recently. So there's Medicine Bluffs sticking up out of the ground, and everyone knew and this area has been regarded as significant, is regarded as eligible for the National Register for many years because it was known that the Comanche carried out some kind of religious practices uh, on Medicine Bluffs, that it was wrapped up in their religion. Well, the Army proposed to put in a new training support center, not on Medicine Bluffs, but down on the low ground around it, about, I think, about half a mile away. Well, the Army said, we've got to do Section 106 review, so what do we do? We'll do an archaeological survey. They did an archaeological survey. They didn't find anything. They said, we have no impact on historic properties. The only historic property around here is Medicine Bluffs, and it's over there. We're not going to hit it, so we don't have a problem. They began building their training support center. Well, then the Comanche said, wait a minute. We do carry out religious rituals up on top of the bluffs, and they involve looking out over the landscape. It's very important to our religious rituals that we have an unimpeded natural landscape out there. Moreover, we stand on the other side and look back toward the bluffs when we pray, and it's very important to have that view unimpeded too. And you guys are putting up your training support center right in the middle of our view, view state that's absolutely critical to our religious practices. Well, the result was that the court issued a preliminary injunction. The court found that there was a possible violation of Section 106 of NEPA and the Religious Freedom Restoration Act. And they, the court halted construction pending a trial. Well, the Army can see the handwriting on the wall. And it walked. It has given up the project. So this case will never go actually to trial. But it's a pretty good indication of what courts can say about projects like this that fall not right on a traditional cultural property, but in the view shape of a traditional cultural property. The court found that the disruption of the sight lines imposed a substantial burden on religious practice, and the government couldn't do it under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act without showing that it had a compelling government interest. The court also found that consultation was inadequate under the National Historic Preservation Act, that the tribe hadn't been properly informed, that data about the project were buried in all kinds of technical appendices that no reasonable person could be expected to read, the tribe wasn't informed of cumulative impacts. And the tribe, when it objected after an arbitrarily defined deadline, their comments were rejected as untimely and ignored. The court found all of those things to be inappropriate. 
And the court said this wonderful thing. Section 106 requires an agency to stop, look, and listen. The evidence in the present case suggests that de defendants merely paused, glanced, and turned a deaf ear to warnings of adverse impact. But it's important to understand that under Section 106, maybe not under the Religious Freedom and Restoration Act, but under Section 106, the Army could have completed the project and been in compliance with the law if it had consulted with the tribes and everybody else who might be concerned, if it had recognized the impacts, if it had sought to resolve them, and if it wasn't able to resolve them, if it had gotten the comments of the Advisory Council and paid attention to those comments. But if, after doing all those things, it decided that the need for the project justified going ahead, it could have done that. In the same way, if Nantucket Sound is found eligible for the National Register as a traditional cultural property or as an airplane or a ship or anything else, if the Secretary of the Interior decides in the end that wind power is more important than the cultural beliefs of the Wampanoag people, the Secretary can say, sorry, Wampanoag, we're going to put the thing in. Whether he can say that under the Religious Freedom Restoration Act is something of another matter. Okay, so we know, we've, we've, we've heard in very eloquent terms about the significance of Nantucket Sound. I don't need to go into that. Um, so let me just put the question to you, or put it out for discussion. Is Nantucket Sound a traditional cultural property? Is it eligible for the National Register? And what do you think the effects of its eligibility will be, if any, on Cape Wind and on other projects that might happen in and around Nantucket Sound? I'd like to just put that out on the floor. I realize we're running a little later than we expected to be, but I hope there can be some discussion. And if there are any questions, comments, stones you want to throw, uh, I'm here to proceed. Thank you. 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 Th